Over the next three weeks, we're going to dive into what it looks like to marry well, to love well, and to finish well. Whether you're single, engaged, newly married, or have been married for decades, there will be something to take away for every season of life. Join us in person or online for our next series, Marriage Hacks. Well, welcome to Mex Online Campus. If there is any word, <laughs> at least one of many words that have gone through a lot of gone through a lot of changes, evolution after evolution over the last, I don't know, 30 or so years, it's the word hack. Uh, originally, it meant uh, to hack away at something, you know, like when you would take an ax to the root of a tree. Then it meant that someone was a hack, meaning they were a blowhard or a fake, or that they weren't any good at what they did. Uh, particularly in journalism, you may have heard someone being called a hack writer or a hack journalist. Then you would get hacked off, meaning you were mad or you were irritated about something. We could also talk about people not being able to hack it, which I guess goes back to that hacking away with you know, wood with an ax, which means you didn't have what it takes to do something. Then it referred, as you know more recently, into uh, breaking into a computer, hacking a computer. So we call them computer hackers, gaining access over security systems and such. Now, while it can still refer to all those things, which would be maddening to someone learning the English language, just trying to figure out what do we mean when we're using the word, now it's usually a reference to finding a good way of doing something, a useful approach, a shortcut, a piece of really good advice. So we talk about things like hacks for our phone, hacks for our TVs, or hacks for a trip to Disney World even. You can even Google and find the top 50 life hacks that have been compiled by various folks and organizations. Everything from uh, you know, tying a colored ribbon onto your luggage before you drop your bag off at the airport so that you can spot it easily at baggage claim, uh, to knowing how to test a battery to see if it was good or bad. And I did not know this one. Well, I was actually looking at some life hack lists, and apparently you, you can you can take a battery, uh, like a C battery or you know AA or something, and you you hold it about six inches above a table, and you you drop it, and if it gives one small bounce and then drops over, falls over, the battery is still good. But if it bounces around any more than that, the battery is dead or on its way out. Here's another one I didn't know about. If you're wanting to start a fire in your fireplace, or maybe you're out camping and you need some kindling to start a fire, uh, Dorito chips. <laughs> I know, I read that. I mean, okay, so you don't eat them, but you can light them on fire and they work as kindling, which makes me not want to eat them anymore. Well, back to the word hack. Uh, so if you were to try and put all those different uses of the word hack into a paragraph, what might it sound like? Maybe something like this. Somebody hacked into my computer so I couldn't work. So I went outside to work off my frustration by hacking away at a tree, but my ax broke, which hacked me off. But my neighbor said I was just a hack and I didn't know what I was doing. My wife just said I couldn't hack it. So I said to hack with her. <laughs> okay, that last one wasn't quite right, but it felt right. <laughs> Maybe I should have just said, well, now it's apparent that I need some serious marriage hacks, which is what this series is gonna be about. Um, we're just going to divide this up. It's just a three-week series, but uh, you know, it's, we're really going to go fast and deep. We're going to divide it up into three eras related to marriage. The first era is marrying well, kind of on the front end of things, the hacks you need to make sure you marry the right person. And then the second week, next week, we're going to talk about loving well, the hacks you need for your marriage to stay alive and, and well and vibrant and healthy and growing. And then we're going to talk in the final week about finishing well, the hacks you need to have your marriage go the distance. So with that as a roadmap, let's start off with marrying well. And doing that will be greatly served by five very specific marriage hacks, beginning with getting the sign off from your family and friends. Now, I know that first one you may not even like, you may not like any of these. I didn't say they'd be popular hacks, just that they're good hacks. They're biblical hacks, ones that really do matter, and they really do work. Here's the idea behind family and friends signing off on your relationship. It's, it's really twofold. First, you have the Bible's absolute unqualified recommendation to get counsel on every major life decision. And there are few decisions more important than who you marry. Let me just give you a sampling from just one book of the Bible, the book of wisdom uh, called Proverbs. 
Proverbs 12, fools think their own way is right, but the wise, they listen to others. Proverbs 15, plans fail for lack of advice, but many advisors bring success. Proverbs 19, get all of the advice and instruction you can, so you will be wise the rest of your life. Just one more, Proverbs 20, make plans by seeking advice. I mean, you get the feel of that, right? And again, not much ranks above the decision of who you're going to marry. So have you sought advice? Have you sought counsel on who it is you're thinking about marrying or wanting to marry? And I say friends and family for some obvious reasons. Who knows you better, right? They're your intimate circle. That's your community. They know you better than anybody else. If you were to go to five random people on the street and ask for advice, you know, just say, hey, should I marry this person? Here's his picture or here's her picture. They're going to ask you questions like, oh, well, no, they're nice looking. Do you, do you love them? Does he, does he have a good job? Does, does she treat you well? Um, you know, obvious questions, but very generic. But they aren't very discerning. They can't be. They don't know you. They don't know him or her. But close friends and family members know you, and they've probably come to know or observe the person that you're dating. They've seen you together. They know what you're like when you're together with that person. They've seen how they've affected you for better or worse. They know what matters to you. They're probably learning a little bit about what matters to them. If you don't seek out their counsel and their advice and listen to it, the Bible says you're just a fool. Now, I know that's strong. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels like a, you know, but it's strong for a reason. It's foolish not to do this. You know what scares me? I hear about someone, let's just say it's a young woman, who is dating someone and it's getting serious. And I hear her friends say, gosh, we just don't like him. I mean, and none of her friends like this guy. None of them think he's good for her. None of them think he's the one. See, I think that's a big deal. If she doesn't know that, that she's a fool. And if her friends haven't told her, they're not very good friends. And if a father or a mother who has invested a lifetime in this person doesn't take them aside and say, dear heart, I, I, I just need to tell you I have serious concerns about whether this person is right for you. And here's why. You need to hear that. Accessing friends and family, getting their sign off, I'm telling you, it's a marriage hack. It works. Use it. Okay, here's the second one. Make sure that they share your vision for family. I know when I first saw a vision for family that I wanted, uh, it was during a sleepover. And I've shared this before in various settings. I was at a, a sleepover at a friend's house when I was in the fifth grade. We played Little League uh, baseball together. I'll never forget it. His name was Doug. And when I went over to his house, I knew within like five minutes that I was experiencing something that was arresting for me. There was no fighting, there was no yelling, the siblings all got along, nobody was cloistered off into the rooms with the door locked, nobody was angry at anybody else. Uh, both parents were there, fully present, uh, and they said they were going to have a family night together, that the night I was over there was happened to be their family night. And I thought I was just being invited to kind of have a normal sleepover, spend some time with my friend. But this was their family night, and I was being enveloped in that, something that I found out that they did every week on this particular night. And I remember thinking, you mean every week, the entire family does something together? And what, what, what that even meant or what that would entail, I had no idea. Well, first, my friend's dad took us into the backyard uh, to play catch. Like there was nothing else in the world on his mind, just playing with us. And he was just giving the whole night over to it. And then we had a meal together. And I mean, the whole family sitting around a table at one time, just talking and laughing and no arguing, no bannering, just enjoying each other. And then I, they got a bunch of pillows and sleeping bags and I think a bean bag chair or two and put them in the back of a pickup truck. And we all went to a drive-in movie. Uh, and they backed the truck in, and then we all climbed into the back to sit and watch the movie. Uh, all of us, the whole family, together. It was so clear that they just enjoyed being with each other. They were just having a blast. Laughter spilled over. Kindness was shown. Patience reigned. Love just flowed. There was just a sense of community. And it wasn't anybody's birthday. Nobody was trying to put on a show. There was no film crew trying to capture something for reality TV. It was just an average, everyday, weekly family night. It was 
who they were. It was what they were. It was what they had. And I remember to this day walking away from that and saying to myself, even as a fifth grade boy, someday I'm going to have a family. And I wanted to look dangerously close to that. <laughs> it's going to feel like that. So I had a vision for family, even as a boy. Uh, first and foremost, that I wanted a family. I mean, deeply. I wanted children. I always wanted a big family. For whatever reason, in my mind, that meant four kids. And, and I knew what kind of family, like I said, what it would feel like, look like, act like. And that just began to grow with other experiences, not just that one. Throughout my life, as I would see other pictures of family life and things, and, and it developed in my mind. And then after I became a Christ follower, I had verses, and as I was reading the scriptures, they began to just permeate my psyche and kindle my spirit. Like from Psalm 68, where it says, you know, God sets the lonely in families. You know, community. From 1 Peter, it says, you should be like one big happy family full of sympathy toward each other, loving one another with tender hearts and humble minds. And then this extended description from Ephesians, which I always found captivating. Wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that show your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. A love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His works, in words, evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her. And that is how husbands ought to love their wives. And this is why a man leaves his father and mother and cherishes his wife, no longer two, but become one flesh. And fathers, don't exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. Take them by the hand and lead them in the way of the master. Wow. Yeah, I could go on and on. That was my vision. Now, you ready for the life hack? <laughs> uh, marry someone who shares that vision, which I did. And it's made such a difference. Susan wanted everything I did. And from that shared vision, we were able to craft an even more detailed vision of family life together. And then that shared vision shaped the decisions and choices that we made as husband and wife and father and mother. I can't even imagine if the basics of that vision had not been shared. You know, if I had wanted kids and she didn't, if I wanted to prioritize home life and she wanted to prioritize career, if I wanted a family marked by a peace and respect and love and grace and character and service and most of all Christ as the pulsating center of it all, and she was indifferent to all of that and even perhaps antagonistic. Friends, when you get married, um, you started a family. Uh, whether you have children or not, your family. And having a shared vision for what that family is going to be like is one of the most important hacks for marrying well that there is. All right, here's the third. Have like-minded financial priorities. If that seems out of sync, oh my gosh, <laughs> you haven't been married. <laughs> one of the things that we didn't get into during our recent series on breaking free from living paycheck to paycheck was the way money impacts our marriages. For those of you who are single and you doubt that this is a big deal, just ask any married couple, I mean any married couple, <laughs> if money is ever an issue, if it's ever been the cause of a fight or an argument or tension, and they'll look at you like, are you kidding? Like, put it in the top three. <laughs> and it usually isn't over the bank statement. It's deeper than that. It's about values and character and beliefs. Money always is. This is how Jesus put it. He said, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Where you invest, what you have is where you have placed your heart. And where you place your heart will determine how you invest. Because the way we use our money is a reflection of values, character, and beliefs. But what happens when you have two hearts that aren't beating the same way? When you're clashing and fighting and conflicting over spending and saving and giving, it's just like the writing on the wall for marital doom. Which is why it doesn't matter whether it's over having too little money or even getting an unexpected windfall. It, either way, a big financial swing in either direction can bring the same conflicts to the surface. Divides on what to do with that money, how to spend that money, where to save, how to give. There was an interesting study that was covered by the Wall Street Journal. The research found that when partners disagreed about mundane financial things, 
grocery bills, shop receipts. Their relationship was not at risk. But if they disagreed over bigger value-based things, like fair contribution to household in income, if they both, uh, fi uh, household finances, if they both have jobs, uh, perceived financial irresponsibility on the part of one or the other, uh, where to give, how much to give, how to give, that was what became serious and proved to be undermining to the marriage itself. And here was something the research found that was I found particularly interesting. Shared values were more important than shared personality traits. Interpersonal chemistry didn't matter as much as values-based chemistry, at least for the long haul of the marriage. And nowhere did that flesh itself out more than financial values. Okay, let's kind of make sure we're catching up with this. So you want to marry well? We've already gone over three big marriage hacks. Have your friends and family sign off on them. Make sure you have a unified vision for family. And have, third, like-minded financial priorities and commitments. There's one more. And it's the biggest hack for marrying well of all. Marry someone who shares your faith. Now, I know that not all of you would consider yourself a Christ follower. In fact, you might not consider your... You, uh, you know, you might put yourself in the agnostic category. I mean, you don't know what to believe or even if there's anything to believe. So spiritual compatibility might seem to you the least important issue of all, uh, maybe even a non-issue. But if you are a person of faith, particularly a Christ follower, this is everything. Uh, nothing, and I mean nothing, is more important than this. If you're a Christ follower, God's will for your life is that whoever you marry should be a follower of Christ too. This is all throughout the Bible, but let me just give you a couple of examples. In writing to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul writes, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone that she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. That was just kind of this assumed thing. In the second letter to the Corinthians, he adds, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? Now, why is that such a big deal? Well, it wasn't meant to put people who don't share the Christian faith down, you know, uh, or to arbitrarily limit the playing field. It was meant to protect people from mismatches and the pain and the separation that can come from that mismatch. And there's no greater, more foundational mismatch than a spiritual mismatch because it's the highest deepest level of intimacy two people can share. Listen, there's, there's, and hopefully you've heard this before, but if not, let's, let's cover this. There's four levels of relational intimacy. The first level is the physical, which is just finding someone attractive. It's also the most superficial of the four. It may be what first made you look their way and they caught your eye, but it's not enough to sustain a relationship over the long haul. Then there's the intellectual level where you challenge and you stimulate one another. You, you share thoughts and you share ideas. You, you have ro these robust and deep and, and, you know, conversations. There's an interesting bit of, um, there's an interesting observation in the Bible uh, about King David and his wife, Abigail. Uh, they didn't have a long courtship, but the heart of what impressed him wasn't simply that she was physically attractive, but that she, she was smart. The Bible goes out of its way to point that out. In fact, here's David's, uh, describing David's attraction to her. It says, she was an intelligent and beautiful woman. That combination, David was attracted to her for her mind, which means as a couple, they had the ability to engage each other on an intellectual level, to find each other interesting and thought-provoking. But you can still go deeper, which brings us to the emotional level of intimacy. Uh, this is enjoying each other's company and having chemistry with each other. You just get along. You like being together. You, they really are your best friend. They're the person who makes you laugh. Uh, the one you can't wait to watch the movie with. The one you can't wait to take the trip with. You know, you don't want to do something without them because it's just so much fun to do it with them. In the Song of Solomon, this is how a woman describes her husband. She said, his mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. And then she says, this is my beloved. This is my friend. That's such a powerful combination, my beloved and my friend. So you have the physical, you have the intellectual, you have the emotional. Most people stop there. I mean, they're done. And if they have those three in place, they talk about that person as being their soulmate. But in truth, we haven't even talked about the soul yet. 
We haven't even gotten to the soul level because there is a fourth level. And that level is the soul level. It is the spiritual level. This is when you relate to each other in light of your mutual relationship and connection with God. Your soul, your actual soul, your spiritual life is the deepest part of who you are. And when that is shared with your spouse, when that is held in common with your spouse, both of you together communing with God, sharing those values and priorities and commitments, then your intimacy is at the deepest level which means that the journey toward full and complete intimacy with each other as a married couple is essentially a spiritual journey. But if you don't reach that level, if that is not a shared dynamic of your relationship, then that will forever remain unexplored territory. No matter how strong the relationship is or how well you get along with each other. And, and don't water this spiritual you know, down. Uh, we're talking about capital S spiritual. We're not talking about small s spiritual. When some people are talking about having a spiritual connection with someone, they're talking about really the emotional stuff, having great chemistry uh, or deep affection or supercharged emotional feelings or even connecting. They have so many like-minded things that they say they're soulmates because we, we like so many of the same things, the same art, the same music, the same type of travel. Or even they connect in unique ways over small s spiritual events or activities like silently soaking in a sunset in a meditative fashion, all of which is well and good. But those things are not what this level is about. This level is about both of you being in a personal relationship with the living God and through that, having God provide, almost create this fourth level. In fact, that's the idea of the two becoming one in and through marriage. And here's how Jesus put it. He said, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. See, that's the goal of marriage. Such intimacy, such bonding that the two becoming one. The two become one. But becoming one is a God thing. God does it, it's a spiritual act. Two becoming one happens when God joins two people together because you can't get that close apart from connecting spiritually. If a relationship with God isn't present in both lives, you can't join together this way. He can't be the tie that binds. You have to have shared spiritual territory to cross over to each other in and through that territory, which is why this is the most important dynamic of married life. But so many people don't even have it on their checklist. They blow it off, they don't care, they just think it's irrelevant. All they care about is, do I find him physically attractive? Do I have the same interests? Do I like the same movies? Do they make me laugh? Oh my goodness, when the real question is, do they have a shared relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus? And if someone comes alongside you and tells you their story of dating someone who wasn't a Christian and they, you know, he later he came, won him to Christ or he became a Christian, now he's this godly guy leading the family spiritually as if that's the plan to follow. It's okay to just marry whoever you want, you know, look at us, look at us. You tell yourself, oh goodness, that not only is that the exception to the rule, but that woman played with fire and took the greatest relational risk anyone can ever take. To me, that's not a yay God story as much as an oh my God story. Almost like seeing someone who just barely misses getting demolished and run over by a truck. So please, don't believe the lie. Go deep on this one. And let me give you two gut check questions to ask about anyone you might be dating um, or are even currently engaged to. First, can they describe a specific time or era during which they received Christ's gift of eternal life. Second, if they were put on trial, on a charge of being a committed follower of Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict them? If the answers on those don't line up, uh, please hear my counsel. Don't start dating. Don't open yourself up emotionally to someone who you know from the outside isn't right for you, someone who is not God's person for you. And if they are a spiritual mismatch, you know they aren't right. And if you're already dating them, yes, I would end it. And if you're already engaged, big sigh here. <laughs> um, 
consider this the last best time to dodge the bullet. That's so, so hard, I know. But this is so, so important. If you are a Christ follower, you're to love God even more than them. And the faith of your children and having a Christ-centered home is what you want most in a marriage, isn't it? Now, I know those four hacks are anything but light. <laughs> they're, they're heavy, they're consequential. And for many of you, I know your head, your heart, your head is just swimming. Uh, you're trying to make sense of how it applies to the complexities of the relationship you're in or the advanced state maybe that your relationship is in or might be in one day. So let me say, and you're wondering how to weigh all of this and sort through and be discerning. So let me suggest a way of thinking about those four hacks in relation to a particular person, a way of applying them, almost using them as, as, as a filter. When it comes to a person you want to date or you are dating or are even engaged to, whatever the situation, you're still on the front end of marriage. You're still in the trying to marry well segment of life. Let me give you one last hack. With everything we've talked about, ask yourself, is their commitment, did it occur before you, beside you, or because of you? Let me tell you what I mean. Um, Take his faith. Let's just talk about faith. Um, did that exist in his life before you? Or was it something that happened beside you as you both explored the Christian faith as non-Christians together and you found Christ together and, and that exploded in your lives? Or did he make some concessions about faith because of you? Th those really are three different things. If it was part of his life before you, it's something real. I mean, it, it, it's part of him independent of you. If it's something that happened beside you or, or by you or with you, I mean, you both came to Christ you know, in faith together, or you introduced him to family values that he truly, deeply now accepts and realizes he just never been exposed to before, or you hammered out joint understandings about money and priorities, and man, you really are on the same page. If all of that happened by you, through you, beside you, then again, you have something that is real in his life that the two of you share. But if it's something that's only in his life because of you, meaning he knows you care about it, he knows it's what you want, he knows it's what you expect to hear, he knows it's a deal breaker for you, and he's playing along because of you, it may not be real at all. And I would be so cautious. I would put things on hold till that gets sorted because family values, financial values, and faith in Christ are not something you want superficially embraced because of you, but something that resided deep in their lives before you or happened with you. Let me play this out. Um, and I'll just paint it from the woman's perspective because I think this is so important to get down. A woman finds herself attracted to a man and he's attracted to her, so he pursues her. And there's nothing more intoxicating, more alluring than being pursued. Uh, couple that with the deep desire for love and companionship, marriage and family, and you already have instant vulnerability um, uh, in this gal's life toward this guy who's pursuing her. But she knows enough to check him out spiritually, and of course he gives the, well, of course I like puppies and I want kids and I believe in God. <laughs> you know, he gives that answer. He passes that test. She asks about church, and it starts to get a little fuzzy. He throws up a line or two about organized religion and being turned off to church because of all the hypocrites and that he feels closer to God in nature than in a building. And, you know, there's some standard stuff like that. In other words, all the normal smokescreen stuff that wants to appear spiritual but not religious and why he's never darkened the doorstep of a church or has best been sporadic, which in truth often means he's not spiritual or religious. But no worry. She asks if he would be willing to go to church with her. And he says, sure, sure, sure. I mean, in his mind, he's thinking, this is a cheap date. <laughs> and not only that, it's also part of the pursuit. And that's what she doesn't see. He's after her. The church thing, the God talk, it's like sending flowers and candy. It's like putting candles on a dinner table and cleaning up his apartment before she comes over. It, it, it's, 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 he's in hot pursuit. The God stuff is just part of getting the girl. And she buys it and she starts opening up her heart to the relationship, but then a strange thing happens. The more she gets to know him, the more they have deep conversations, the more she sees that he really is not a spiritual guy at all. In fact, he's never given his life to Christ. 
He believes in God, but only in the most general cultural sense in terms of Jesus, though being a deep driving factor in his life in terms of coming to Jesus as leader and forgiver, in terms of being a spiritual leader for their relationship, uh, it's, it's not there. And she's starting to see it. But she buries it, rationalizes it, sugarcoats it, pushes it off to the side in terms of importance. She doesn't let it come into full view to grapple with with all of its importance. And here's why. Because she let it get this far, because she didn't take the spiritual mismatch seriously on the front end and dove into dating, something's happened. She gave her heart. And emotions are now overruling her head. So she starts the evangelistic dating stuff. <laughs> she starts buying him books and connecting him with Christian friends and giving him links to sites and blogs and podcasts and messages. She goes on a mission to transform him, to make him into something that he wasn't. And that's when she sees what he's not and what he never really was. But she's romantically involved. She decides to fix it by giving him a spiritual makeover. And he, and he lets her do it to a degree. Uh, he takes the books, he comments on the links, he says he's open, and because he's playing along, she thinks she's covered. So when the question comes, will you marry me? She's already said yes a thousand times in her heart, never once let no even enter her mind, but she goes for the spiritual prenup. <laughs> uh, will you keep going to church with me? I gotta know. Will we raise our kids in a Christian home? Will Christ be in this? You know. What's he going to say? What is he going to say? Seriously. Um, is he going to say, are you kidding? That's all been part of the wine and roses, candles and dinners. Babe, once I get you down the aisle. Uh, Sundays are for my recliner and football, Budweiser and wings. You can do all you want, but count me out. Raise the kids any way you want, but you know I'm not going to be a part of that picture. Is that what he's going to say? Not likely. He's going to say, well, of course, honey, I want what you want. I want God in our life. He's just after the deal. And once he gets the deal, he's done. Now, hear me on this. I'm not trying to throw this guy under the bus. He's not a bad guy. He's really not trying to purposefully deceive. His heart is gone too, which is why he'll do anything, say anything, give anything to win you. He's probably even sincere about some of it because he's so deeply sincere about you. But when the deal is done, when the aisle is walked, that's when reality kicks in for every couple. The wedding becomes a memory. The romance fades. Uh, you find sex isn't everything, much less living together and setting up home and, and celebrating holidays and playing house and even the first child or two. And that's when it happens. You realize that connecting spiritually really was everything for marriage and family. You realize that you're going to be waking up every day to someone with whom you can never share the deepest parts of who you are. You can never grow together in the places that matter most. You can never talk about the most important of things. Shared values become not so shared. Priorities become so radically different. Suddenly, Mr. Perfect is not anymore. But that's the point. He never was. Because what makes someone perfect wasn't there to begin with. The deepest, most important thing in your relationship was missing. And then the kids come along. And the spiritual leadership isn't there for them either, which means that spiritually you become a widow. You become spiritually a single parent mom. Now, and, and you, you know, who so wanted marriage and a family, and you remain devoted to both, you carry a grief, even a guilt that you can't ever escape. You wanna know how I can tell that whole narrative? because I have seen it played out a thousand times. It's like somebody wrote a script and I've seen it played out over and over and over again. Folks, there really are some life hacks, especially when it comes to marrying well. Get your family and friends to sign off on anyone that you might be thinking of getting serious with. Make sure there's a unified vision for family. Talk about money and make sure you have the same values, the same priorities. Take what God says about spiritual mismatches as seriously as he does. Ask yourself also then the tough questions about all of those things. Was this in their life before me? Is it in their life beside me? We journeyed on this one together. 
Or are they saying and doing it all because of me and it's not really a part of who they are at all? The answers to those matter. A lot. Well, next week, we're going to look at some marriage hacks for those who are already married. And that's not just for the married. That's for everyone who wants to be. Because if you can help it, you don't want to learn these hacks on the job. But take heart, married folk. Uh, every one of those hacks better learned late than never. Until then, let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for the beauty of marriage, the wonder and mystery and joy that it is, and how eager you are to bless it and bring two people to become one. I do pray for those who have yet to marry but are in the process, they're dating, they're engaged, they hope to be one day. I hope this served. I really do. And I know that there could be some really hard things to wrestle with at the end of this conversation. Be with them as they wrestle with it, Lord. Whatever the right thing is to do, they'll never regret doing it if it was right by you. No, I pray all that in Jesus' name.